and uh, as we all and as we all know the ultimate goal of every farmer as they go to the farms is to make a profit out of what they do they want to realize some profit from their efforts and therefore if we are not able to sell our produce it is a big challenge and um, from our previous conversations we've realized that most of the farmers do very good work in the farm producing their produce but then getting to the market becomes a challenge either they are not getting the markets or if the markets are there the prices are not um, good enough and so many other challenges including policies that affect uh, marketing therefore today we have two presenters they come with a wealth of experience and expertise in marketing. And uh, I am sure all of us will learn from them. And of course, it could be a point of networking and collaboration as well. Therefore, I'm encouraging everyone to inform uh, their friends, their colleagues to join us today for this session. Because at the end of the day, I am sure people's life will not be the same. Those who did not know how to or where to sell their produce, this could be a, a place for networking. We will have uh, two presenters. One of them is uh, Samuel Landongo of Cohen and uh, Sylvia Kuria of Sylvia's Basket. I'm therefore going to invite uh, Sylvia to introduce herself, and then uh, Landongo will uh, introduce himself and start us off. Therefore, without further ado, I welcome uh, Sylvia Kuria to introduce herself. Karibu, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Misoi, and i um, happy to be here. And also, uh, you know, just to be presenting with my friend, Sam. Uh, we've worked together for many years, of course, especially in this uh, space of marketing and we continue to do so. So as uh, Grace said, I'm Sylvia Kuria, and I'm one of the master trainers in the program. And uh, I'm a farmer, organic farmer, and I'm also an entrepreneur. I have been running Sylvia's Basket, I think now it's eight years. This will be our eight years, uh, you know, whereby we've been selling um, our produce. And I'm really excited, uh, you know, to have the chance today to actually share about our experience, you know, how have we done it, uh, what are the lessons learned, what part in local organic markets work, you know, from my experience, what is challenging, but also you know, just to also motivate all of us to know that uh, we can get into the space of markets. As Misoi said, when farmers go to the farm, the end goal is the market. So we need more people in the marketing space because producers, we have lots of producers, but markets is what we are struggling with. So I'm going to um, give my brother, Sam, a chance to start. And when he's done, then I'll be able to come in and share our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And now I welcome Mr. Samuel Ndongo of Kohan. Karibu, Sam. Uh, thanks, Chris. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Yeah. So my name is Samuel Ndongo. I work with the Kenya Organic Agriculture Network uh, as a program manager. Uh, I have worked with the, in the organic sector for some time, uh, developing guarantee systems and uh, helping uh, farmers and companies to uh, get organic certification. Uh, I've been working on PGS uh, for some time now. And uh, today, as uh, Sylvia Steve, Steve has mentioned, uh, we want to discuss issues of PGS and market. And for me, I've been discussing about uh, PGS. How do we uh, develop a PGS, uh, both at the group level, at the national level, uh, developing structures, uh, in those two reports, uh, so that by the end of this uh, presentation, then uh, we can have more knowledge on this, and uh, we can be confident. Uh, if you are an extension staff, you are working with a PGS group, working on developing a PGS, uh, then this can be a very good, uh, you know, information uh, that you can use. So I, I welcome you to this uh, uh, presentation and this webinar. Um, we have these two presentations, and then after this, then we have a question and answer session. So um, I think we can start now. And uh, I'm trying to move to the next. 
Yeah. So why do we need guarantees? Do we really need the guarantee system? And uh, why, why, why do, how do can a guarantee help? Um, if you look at the organic standards of the USDA, we call it NOP, or National Organic Program, they give uh, a limit uh, up to which the amount that the farmer can actually get satisfied or can be under guarantee system. They say if you are a farmer who is producing or who is handling um, organic products for less than $5,000, then you actually don't need to be satisfied. And why they, they say this is that the guarantee system, especially that participation system, is actually expensive. And if you are producing or you are earning um, an annual turn of over $5,000, then you cannot uh, afford to pay. Uh, or if you pay, then you'll be on debt. Um, so sometimes guarantee systems are not necessary, uh, especially when your production is, is, is um, the value is quite small. And uh, that, that's the other thing I'm, I'm thinking about. If you have a small farm, if you have a quarter of an acre or an eighth of an acre, and whatever you are producing is a raw value crop, or maybe you have some few portable gardens, you may not need to be satisfied because once you uh, satisfy, especially due to that public education system, uh, then the amount of money that you'll be uh, you know, paying will be higher than what you'll be earning. Uh, out of your, your production. Or in, if you are selling to your neighbor, because guarantee is, uh, you know, is, is, a, is where you want to and, and you know, communicate to your customer that actually your production system is following the organic standard. So if there is a way that, um, you, uh, another way that you can use sales for to communicate to your customer, maybe a customer coming to your farm, uh, checking how you are doing your production, you may not need to have another person who is a third party to come and guarantee you because you're already using another way of guarantee. The visit, farm visits that uh, that customer comes to check is uh, enough to guarantee that uh, you're following the standards uh, that you are saying you are following. Maybe it's, if it's organic standards, you are actually following organic standards. Because once the, the, the neighbor or the friend comes to your farm, uh, he or she is seeing how you are producing your, your crop. So uh, I want us to see guarantee from uh, that perspective that you are building the uh, consumer confidence on the production system that you are using. And sometimes it doesn't make sense when you are producing um, low scale of product production and uh, your turnover is quite uh, very low. And uh, there are Different two types of um, uh, guarantee systems uh, that are available in organic uh, agriculture or according to organic standards. We have the third party system, and the third party system is where you have a, you know, a company which is recorded a third party uh, coming to check the farmer how he's producing, or it can be somebody who is handling organic products or somebody who is processing organic products. And then um, checking again the standards which are set and giving a certificate or certification that actually that producer or processor or somebody who is handling is actually following those organic standards. Um, normally, this system is done by private companies. And because private companies are uh, profit motivated, this type of system is uh, quite expensive. And uh, sometimes it discourages uh, persons or companies which are acting on very low level of production or processing. And uh, if they do actually certify, then they really struggle uh, to renew their certification because certification is normally an annual cost and they are supposed to pay every year. The other form of guarantee is the participatory guarantee system, which is the alternative to that party system. And this is what we'll be discussing uh, a lot. Uh, and participatory uh, guarantee system uh, started being developed in 2004. Um, when I form, uh, developed a, a committee, an ad hoc committee, to look at the alternative guarantee systems which are available globally, and then um, come up with a, a, a common way uh, that those systems, which are alternative guarantee systems,
people. Don't know, we are losing you. Kindly check your connection. Sorry for that. I think uh, we are getting Sam back. Kindly be patient as the way to get yeah. him back. Yeah, I don't know what is happening, but uh, Continue. yeah. So, yeah, if consumers can um, take this word drop off and then put some trust in it and some preference, it's a like communicating something. You know, it can start for some you know, guarantee of some sort. And uh, if in that study also, the specific percent of consumers actually prepared food produced by smallholder farmers. And uh, they also prepared food collected from home area, uh, which they prepared as a drop of food. And if you look at uh, this uh, three statements, and then also put into consideration that uh, people have been preparing or there has been some trends uh, or people preparing traditional foods, you know, have a cup of food, uh, African river vegetables, which are also considered raw for. Uh, you know, this is showing that, and, and most of us, I, I'm sure we, we like eating uh, dromas, squashes, you know, uh, managu, terere. And we actually prepare, I, I put some, um, you know, um, uh, premium in, in this product. You know, if, for example, you look at the, uh, the raw chicken. There is some premium, even if it's not organic, there is some premium that has been put to this chicken. And what I'm trying to drive at is that ROCO can also be used as a way of guarantee if there are systems and then procedures to back it up. And if you look at PGS, it's actually a back on ROCO food production system. That's why PGS is actually a very strong uh, guarantee system. If it can be developed and uh, if people can embrace it, because it, it also incorporates local and cultural values uh, within society. And um, uh, yes, con continue. So looking at the definition of PGS, uh, probably we already know uh, what is a PGS, but we say that it's a system of trust. Sorry, uh, Ndongo, kindly share yes. your screen. Share your screen kindly. Uh, sorry, um, this technology sometimes happens. Understandable. Yeah, it's happened. I don't know what happened with my internet. I hope you can see that. Yes, we can put it on presentation mode. Yeah, I already done. I hope Perfect. Go ahead. Mode. Yeah. So I hope we were able to follow this uh, other slide where we're talking about we're talking about raw up as a PGS and uh, looking at the trade, what is happening in the in this practical action survey, and also the current trends where people are preparing traditional foods and have of foods and African vegetables and putting some premium on this food, not because they are organic, uh, but because they are awful. Yeah? And uh, I was saying that the PGS also is embedded on ROCO and uh, you know cultural setup, and that's why it's actually strong. So a definition of PGS is a system based on trust, 
uh, with the known consequences. So trust is very important, very key in PGS and uh, consequences. Because um, when trust is broken uh, within a PGS system, there should be consequences. Yeah? Because if there are no consequences, then there's no system. So the system itself is embedded on this trust and all the participants, uh, they understand that if this um, um, you know, trust is broken, then there's no guarantee. But if it's maintained, then the guarantee is studied. And the more important thing also is that the PGS allows consumers and, and farmers and the stakeholders in general uh, along the value chain together to create the system, to co-create the system uh, so that there is transparency and, and trust. So they work together. PGS cannot be just be for farmers. Uh, we have to integrate the other, other stakeholders, uh, consumers, um, you know, extension officers, uh, you know, other stakeholders that can be involved so that there is that um, co-creation and, and people feel they are part of the system. Um, and, and the transparency itself really helps build trust because if there is no transparency, then uh, there is no trust. And once a, a trust is built, and everybody um, is involved in the operations of the PGS, then that trust can translate to a cost. Yeah? And because that trust is what is enabling the guarantee system to stand. And farmers can actually use that uh, with little cost, and then they can continue producing organic, selling to consumers um, who are working with them, who know them, and consumers can be able to access uh, safe food, uh, which will not be uh, priced at a premium cost because there's, there's retro uh, cost involved. And then this brings connection to the whole process of, of organic farming. So we are talking about um, a system where stakeholders are working together. Uh, there is trust and, and transparency in place. And Farmers are using that, that trust as, as to provide guarantee. Because as I said before, uh, in the rock of food system, um, what we just need is for consumers to believe and, and trust what we are providing them, we are actually following the standard. So if we involve them in the system and they can see what we are doing, uh, they are involved in passing, for example, the internal regulations that we have. Um, they also come to, to our meetings, they listen to what we, we do. We are, we are involving them also in the peer review and visiting farm. That is enough guarantee for them to be sure that we are actually following the organic regulation. And um, why PGS is important? Um, there, are, there are so many um, good things about PGS, uh, which have been currently documented. Um, you know, also from my experience, we have experienced them. For those who have been working with PGS Group, they know this. For example, um, that party certification is quite expensive. Uh, it discourages all the farmers. There are very few farmers who are, have been able to pay for their certification cost through the third party. And we know most of our farmers are actually more scale farmers. So their scale of, uh, of production is quite low. And therefore, the cost of production compared to the income they are getting from their farming is quite low. And then uh, most consumers, uh, our consumers in our, in our setup, uh, especially our Africa, African setup, they may not be prepared to pay for premium price, especially if you look at the landscape of middle and lower income too, uh, both rural and urban consumers. That means that we need to have a, a way of uh, reducing the cost um, of real production and certification so that we remain competitive. Uh, because uh, even if we are organic farmers and we have consumers preparing to buy our organic food, remember that we are also in a, in a market where there are also other products which are competing with our product. So uh, that's a very important uh, uh, advantage of PGS because when that system is uh, cheaper or lower the price, then that means that Farmers don't need to put the premium price on their product. And then most parties that uh, most third party certified organic production or products are, are for export. 
uh, or they add up to the export market. Because in the export market, uh, we can be able to get a premium or they can be able to get a premium and then cover their certification cost and therefore they can remain in the market. Um, but um, if you look at the PGS, it's actually for local production. This is for, for us um, or for our, our, our market here. And then there is a, there is a need to bring organic to the mass market. Um, if we have production um, as only for that part, uh, that means there's limitation of how many farmers can actually produce as organic. Then that means it should take us a long time before we bring organic product to the mass market. By mass market, I mean if you go to the open air market where most uh, consumers, you know, buy their product, uh, there needs to be organic product um, uh, stationed there so that consumers can make a choice: do I need to buy uh, organic or do I need uh, buy conventional? For example, in our Kenya setup, we only see organic uh, versus conventional in some few supermarkets. So what we need now is to have organic in all the supermarkets, in all the open air markets, so that consumers can get the choice uh, whether they want to buy organic or they need uh, they want to buy conventional. And this can only come when we adopt the PGS and therefore expand um, the number of farmers who are producing and therefore get more products to the market. The third party certification scheme, uh, you know, when you look at it, most of people who certify uh, through this system, they are either through um, what we call group certification schemes, which are based on contract production, where um, exporters, or we call them operators, are the ones who pay for certification costs. It's very rare for, to see farmers paying for their own certification costs. Um, you only see this when you have big commercial farms or large farms, uh, which are getting certified. So that means that uh, PGS is, is actually very adequate, very good, where farmers themselves can actually uh, initiate this and get certified themselves. And uh, we also see uh, a lot of farmer empowerment in PGS, um, both in governance, building their capacity, uh, strengthening their participation in the market. And, and this actually brings sustainability of uh, farming system. Uh, because you see, uh, we are building farming systems which will continue uh, without uh, outside support or interference. And PGS, of course, is definitely cheaper because, um, as I said before, there is a lot of volume sharing uh, and we are actually substituting this trust to the cost. Um, so farmers are not paying a lot of money, but using their time to ensure that they are. Yeah, they are having meetings, they are doing peer reviews, uh, checking uh, the other farmers to ensure that they are following the internal regulations which they have agreed on. So actually this makes uh, PGS to be cheaper. And then uh, PGS can actually be very useful in supplying organic products to the mass markets. Uh, as I said, because um, they are locally uh, stationed. So where we have open air markets, they can actually get a space and, you know, put their product or display their product. And, and this can happen all over the country. So uh, they are very uh, important. And PGS is also based on such simple supply chain, uh, no middlemen uh, in between. So, and, and that actually brings competitiveness of the pricing. Uh, this study that was done last year by Structural Action uh, in Kenya it showed that um, PGS products are actually priced between, priced between 93 to 95% uh, lower than uh, conventional products. You know, the farmers market that was studied. And they studied uh, about six, seven organic farmers markets. So this actually shows that when we embrace PGS, um, we will actually be able to compete with conventional products and therefore provide a very good opportunity for our farmers to uh, participate in the market. And the, the other thing is that uh, PGS as a system um, can actually be used in both organic as a production system where we have organic standards, but also in other uh, agroecological uh, you know, system. Um, you know, we have been discussing about this agroecology, um, agroecological system 
for some time, and whether this is synonymous with organic systems or different. Uh, but for me, the way I see it is that agroecological uh, systems, they are quite broad, they are wide. Uh, inside agroecology, we have regenerative agriculture, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, sustainable agriculture, we have, uh, you know, biointensive agriculture, we have so many systems within agroecology systems. And some of the systems in here uh, do not prohibit um, fully the use of synthetic, uh, you know, pesticides and fertilizers. So um, what I want to mean here is that when we have um, a way of developing standards for this system, then PGS can be used as a currency system for also this production system. Yeah. So we can have PGS groups for which are doing sustainable agriculture. Yeah. Where they are basing their production system to some form of standards which are based on sustainable agriculture. Yeah. If you are doing regenerative agriculture, you can have a PGS for which are based on regenerative agriculture, you know, practices. And therefore, you have standards which are, you know, backing that system. Uh, because PGS can be seen as a system which can be used in various forms. And then uh, PGS uh, local markets can actually form part of um, ecotourism. And uh, we will be discussing with the county government to see, can they be able to integrate PGS as part of the ecotourism uh, system uh, support? Because if you can have a, a good PGS market, and then it agrees not just uh, organic foods, uh, organic products, but also natural and food products, you know, that can also attract um, some, some tourists to be coming and, you know, doing shopping for, you know, cultural products, um, you know, and, and other products which can be interesting for them. So we can see PGS as a way that can be used in, in, that, in that form. And uh, PGS can also be a very good uh, way of developing raw organic markets or markets in the rural areas, uh, because you know markets can be uh, PGS markets can be created anywhere, because even in the rural areas you also have organic consumers uh, who would like to buy organic products. So organic is not just for the right in the urban market, but also in the rural areas. So in Kenya, uh, PGS um, has been growing, has been uh, developing. Uh, we started in 2013 uh, with one group. Um, currently, we have about, uh, uh, straight, I think, 26 groups now, uh, because this was in 2021. Uh, the growth has not been very significant. Of course, there has been some, some challenges dating to capacities and uh, you know, being, people being able to convert their groups to PGS, uh, and we address these challenges, one together with uh, our other partners, uh, so that we see PGS uh, growing a bit faster in, in Kenya. Uh, but if you look at the, even the number of farmers, uh, currently about 16 that four farmers, uh, this we can say is a bit slow, uh, but we are working on improving this. Uh, for now, acreage you have about 2,520 acres acre under PGS um, for farmers who are doing PGS in the different parts of the country. Uh, but we are working on this to see how this can be improved. The PGS is based on 11 common features uh, that were developed by that technical committee, uh, which now has been made um, a permanent committee within IFOAM. And uh, one of these uh, features is uh, that PGS should be based on recognized uh, production standards. That even if farmers are developing their own internal rules and uh, regulations, those regulations should be based on some organic some production standards uh, which have been recognized by I1 as part of the family of the standards. Um, because if it if it has to be open, then uh, there might be challenges of actually comparing PGS groups across different countries. And uh, the group should come up with the rules or norms. And these norms should be also be uh, developed together with other stakeholders 
uh, so that uh, the stakeholders also understand what they mean and the, the, the requirements and what the farmers are following. Uh, we also say that PGS should be built by from the grassroots by, by farmers themselves, uh, also inviting other stakeholders. It should be appropriate for smallholder farmers. Uh, it should not be for, for big farmers. So the system itself should be supportive of how smallholder farmers are, for example, producing through rain fed agriculture. They don't produce all the time. And sometimes when they don't have produce, all the time they have produce, uh, they also produce more quantities. So it should be supportive of that. Uh, also should uh, have the principles and values should reflect natural uh, producers. Uh, when the internal rules and regulations are developed and the systems and procedures, they should not go against the culture of the producers. Um, it should actually respect uh, or adapt some of the cultural values and, and systems uh, embedded in culture uh, so that they can form part of the PGS. Uh, because culture is very significant, it has um, an important role in the lives of, of uh, people. Uh, so it should be also reflecting what the PGS group are uh, doing. And the, the management uh, system should be documented, even the procedures that the farmers are following. Uh, so there should be uh, records which are kept on, uh, for example, how farmers are bringing in new members, you know, how they are doing their peer review uh, should be documented, the sanctions or punishments that they are giving, uh, how they are running their general assembly, you know, their meetings, uh, how they are doing their marketing uh, system structures. So all that should be documented. Uh, so that, and, and this builds trans transparency uh, because uh, if anybody uh, comes to check how the group is doing, uh, they can be able to show. Uh, and also we see that even the documentation should be open and transparent and free for anybody to come and check uh, how they're doing. There has to be a way of verifying that farmers are following the internal rules. And this is principally done through the peer review uh, of course, the assumption is that these farmers are close to each other. Uh, so therefore, during the, uh, when they are doing their farm work, they are visiting each other. But there is, should be a time when uh, the PGS group go to all the members' farms. Uh, of course, they should have some checklists on the inter internal regulations, and then they check compliance with these internal regulations for each member. Uh, PGS should also in incorporate um, technical development or training for farmers, capacity development, uh, through maybe exchange uh, visits to other farms uh, or other groups, uh, you know, attending field days, uh, having sessions for training uh, from experts, uh, or maybe from one of the lead farmers, uh, visiting each other, learning from each other. And this is very important because uh, PGS, farmers in PGS, have a lot of knowledge uh, of production uh, in Uganda. And the PGS members should uh, take a pledge. And the pledge uh, is a commitment uh, that they normally give to uh, follow the internal regulations, uh, committing themselves that they are part of the group. And uh, in case they notice one of the members who are not following the regulation, uh, they you know tell the other members or report that member. Uh, because they, they are together. Uh, so the pledge is normally done. Uh, maybe lifting their heart, they can say, I pray, I'll be following the internal regulations, or they can sign somewhere or, or put their up thumb, thumb uh, to agree the internal rules. And PGS can develop their own uh, label or a seed, which they can be using to market the group and create that brand for their group. And they also need to have a system of punishment, uh, where if a farmer or if one of the members is not following the internal regulations, then there are consequences, uh, which are well stipulated. Uh, the punishment system, because uh, sanction system should be clear and known to all the members of the group. So these eleven features are quite important. And if you are making a PGS group, uh, then it should have um, like um, screen where you check whether each, each, each of these features are in your, your PGS group. 
um, the um, committee of PGS within IFAM also developed these key elements, which are six elements of PGS uh, to guide uh, also on the developing a PGS. And the PGS group needs to have a, a shared vision across all the stakeholders. And the stakeholders here, we mean uh, the farmers themselves, uh, consumers, and other stakeholders, as you can see there. Uh, stakeholders can be local NGOs, extension workers, or consultants. Uh, so one of the um, things that you can do to build a shared vision is to have like a meeting uh, where you invite these uh, stakeholders, and then you um, go through um, uh, the, the PGS requirements, uh, the vision of the group, uh, maybe the internal regulation, and together you you pass a resolution to be following this regulation, and uh, together also with the uh, stakeholder and, and consumer. Um, also, PGS there has to be participation, participation of both the stakeholder, uh, consumers, uh, but also farmers themselves. Uh, what do we mean by uh, participation of farmers themselves? Is that uh, for example, you don't need to have a situation where you have only one or a few people who are controlling the group, and the other members, they don't know what is happening. The leadership within the group should be rotational in nature, uh, meaning that you can't have a chairman of a group who is a uh, chairman for you know more than three years. There's, there has to be some change. Uh, and and that's the, within the entire leadership of the group. Um, the other thing is that within the group, you can have different committees uh, of the other farmers uh, participating in the different committees so that each of the farmer has a role within the PGS group. Uh, we do not have a situation where some members of the group are not participating uh, in the operation of the PGS group. And uh, transparency, as I said, comes because um, farmers in the PGS group they have an open door policy. They are inviting uh, visitors to come and see what they are doing. So they are exchanging with other PGS groups, and they are also exchanging with other stakeholders. Uh, they are opening their documentation for for, for checking uh, by other for visitors and other stakeholders, uh, and that that means that anybody can see uh, what the PGS group is doing and be confident that they, they are actually uh, following their own internal rules and procedures which they are, they are set. Um, trust is also very key. And uh, as, as we said before, this word trust is what actually um, like um, uh, supplements or, or it's the one that takes the cost of certification. Uh, because if there is no trust within PGS, then there is no PGS. Um, trust comes because farmers, when they are forming the PGS, they are conscious that they are coming to do organic farming. Nobody, nobody is forcing them to be join the PGS group. They are coming to do it because they know that it's a good thing to do. Uh, doing organic uh, farming is, is the right way to, to do uh, farming, to provide good food to consumers and also to their families. And that consciousness with them is what supports the trust that comes with it. So you don't expect a farmer who is a, a group member to also continue using, for example, chemicals if uh, in the internal rules they don't use chemicals. Uh, because you know he's not being forced to be within the PGS. You know, he has a choice. Yeah. Because that he has that consciousness. So he's somebody who can be trusted. And uh, that trust is available to all the group members. Um, and also is shown to people who are outside. Or who are the stakeholder. Uh, PGS also is uh, based on the running process uh, because within PGS there is a lot of uh, running and capacity development and PGS group has to be proactive in ensuring that their members are involved in this. Uh, maybe they are organizing a few days as I said, uh, they are organizing some, some training for their members, they are visiting other PGS groups to run, uh, they are calling some consultants to come and train them. Uh, and, and this process should be continuous um, throughout. They are also visiting each other to run. Actually, when they are doing their peer review, 
it is a peer review checking plus running. So the peer review committee also invites other members to also participate so they can also run from each other. Uh, PGS also should be based on you know horizontality. Uh, horizontality meaning that there is no a member of the group who is senior than the other one, uh, you know, who should be dictating to others. You know, every member of the PGS, you know, is the same, should be looked at as, as just a member. Uh, so even when the peer review uh, reports are being um, evaluated, they are not evaluated by a committee or some few people, but rather they are evaluated by the whole general assembly. That is quite important because even if it's a chairman uh, report which is being discussed, it should be discussed by all the members. Yeah. And uh, it, it should not, not be favorable within the PGS because everybody is the same uh, within the group. So these six um, elements are quite important in PGS when PGS is being developed. And uh, the, if you are involved in developing a PGS, you should ensure that uh, these six elements are actually embedded uh, within the PGS. Um, let's talk about the stakeholders. Sometimes we have been challenging to bring in stakeholders within the PGS. And sometimes you see uh, many PGSs are just um, formed by farmers and no other stakeholder is involved in the activities of the PGS. Uh, and this is quite. Um, uh, weakness which, which has been uh, happening. It's quite important to try to have motivation for involving stakeholders, other stakeholders within the PGS. They may be traders who have an interest in buying from, from farmers. They may be consumers who are, have an interest in buying from the farmers. They may be NGOs or extension workers who are working with the farmers. Could be governments. Uh, in Kenya, we have, for example, county governments. That could be one of the county government officials uh, who is participating within the PGS. It is quite important to have a PGS, not just by farmers themselves, but also including other stakeholders. Uh, this brings the legitimacy on the PGS and encouraging what we are talking about, the transparency um, of the PGS, uh, and also bringing this confidence, especially to consumers or buyers who can be traders. Uh, working with the farmer. So uh, in terms of building a PGS, a building block, it's important to have some situational analysis to have more understanding uh, of the group. If you're a facilitator, you want to facilitate a PGS group, it's important to understand the group, um, to know why it was formed, you know, what are their mission, vision, uh, what are their needs. Uh, this understanding in the beginning is quite important. So that uh, when you are helping them to, to have a vision of PGS, then um, it can align with what is already their vision. Um, also understanding the, uh, their, their, you know, their governance, their leadership uh, structure, and whether uh, you know, that leadership has a motivation towards PGS is, is quite important. Of course, the next step is bringing stakeholders, and then you have a shared vision. Could be in a general assembly or some meeting that has been organized uh, so that uh, that visioning can be can be achieved and then the uh, next step is dividing and agreeing on how the pgs will work uh, of course uh, you need to build the uh, systems and the structures for the pgs uh, records and documentation ensure that um, this is clear and every member of the pgs uh, understands the both the, the procedures and the systems which have been developed and, and how they are supposed to work and their different responsibilities. So what is the responsibility of, uh, of the member? What is the responsibility of the consumer if it's a part of the PGS, uh, the trader, other stakeholders? If there are leadership or there are committees within the PGS, what are their different roles and responsibilities? The next uh, step is to of operationalize the PGS or implement the PGS. You know, you can have very good um, system, which is documented. Uh, you can have good procedures which are documented, but they are not uh, implemented. Nobody is following it. Uh, 
uh, a previous is not complete if the rules, the regulation, procedure, systems which are set in, in the PGS are actually done or implemented. So if you have said that before a member of the group, for example, in the procedure for joining a group, uh, that that member should uh, pay 50 shillings, uh, should be trained on organic, uh, you know, should be you know, visited uh, his or her farm, and then you just bring a member and then you don't do those things. You know, you haven't implemented the PGA. If, for example, you have indicated that uh, every year you have a peer review committee visiting all the members of uh, the PGAs and checking with a checklist, um, you know, which you have agreed on, and then you don't do that. So then you are not implementing a PGA. And you can't say that you have a PGS. So a PGS is where you also implement uh, your operationalize what you have set as procedures, systems, and, and documentation. Of course, the next step, of course, is important to do a peer review as, uh, annually, and then submitting that uh, peer, uh, peer review report for approval. Uh, in Kenya, uh, Koan is, a, is the one that is doing the uh, you know, PGS approval uh, through the National uh, PGS Committee, uh, which, has, which now is now in place. So when you submit that, and then the committee looks at the, uh, the peer review report, uh, then they give you an approval letter or certificate for the member. So these are the steps uh, for building uh, PGS. Uh, in terms of building a national structure for PGS, uh, as, as I coined together with stakeholders in Kenya, we have been trying to build a national structure for PGS. Um, it's, it's quite important uh, to do situational analysis, uh, needs assessment, uh, you know, understanding all the, the groups of PGS. And uh, this process we started uh, last year when we had the first, first national uh, PGS workshop. Uh, you need to have some standards that you're using for, for, for Kenya and other East African countries. We use East African organic product standards. Uh, it's quite important. And as I said here before, is that if, for example, you are working on, uh, for example, regenerative agriculture or sustainable agriculture, uh, you need also to have standards which are based on those systems so that PGS can work for you. Uh, because you need to work with some standards. Uh, of course, we agreed on the national structure, uh, which is composed of the, uh, the National PGS Committee, the National PGS Office, and then the uh, team of assessors and the COTs. Uh, initially, there was a proposal to have regional um, committees, uh, but it has, has not been accepted yet by the National PGS you know, workshop. Uh, because it was felt that uh, these are a lot of structures which are not which are not sustainable, uh, but maybe something that can come in the in the future. It's very important to think about capacity development of workers. Uh, that's why we do training on PGS so that we have more and more workers uh, aware about PGS and how it can be developed. And uh, the actors here also training not just uh, farmers uh, but also. Uh, also doing market development activities uh, so that uh, by initiating, for example, organic farmers markets or working with the traders, creating linkages uh, with the market, it helps to provide PGS group with the opportunities to market their products. And uh, when we talk about capacity development, I uh, also want to draw these two differences. Uh, because there could be capacity development for, for leaders of the PGS. And uh, as I said, leader of uh, PGS, there should be rotational leadership. Uh, so, of course, we end up training everybody on uh, uh, group leadership. Um, and in this uh, or group leaders, so when you look at the uh, what you can train or what you can build capacity on for group leaders, uh, one is group leadership, uh, responsibility of leaders, you know, how they can uh, be ensuring that the rules and regulations, the, the procedures and systems are being followed, uh, documentation or record keeping, because there are uh, the group records which should be kept 
so they should not be just be kept by the secretary, but also every other leader within the group where he or she is working uh, has to keep some, some record. Uh, so th this is quite important uh, to show also for transparency purpose. The other important issue is the group dynamic. Um, group dynamic is uh, where you you work with the readers to ensure that uh, they are they understand how to deal with the you know other members, how the interaction between members uh, you know should be done uh, because the individuals are different and there may be misunderstandings within the group. So how do you say, for example, resolve issues which are coming out from uh, uh, you know the differences between between members. And if there are conflicts, how do they uh, do conflict resolution within a group? So this is part of group dynamics, which should form part of capacity development of group leaders. Of course, ensuring that they understand their roles and responsibilities, uh, and they are actually implementing them. The other level of capacity development is the, the, the members of the group. Uh, you know, they can be trained on how to do peer review uh, using the templates that they are, they, they are developed. Uh, understanding the questions and how to ask them and to evaluate the compliance level, uh, how to be good farmers, good organic farmers to do good organic production uh, of the different crops that they are doing, uh, maybe doing value addition if they are doing processing on the farm or they are doing joint processing, how they package and market their products. Uh, they are also on the responsibility within the PGS group as members uh, and then uh, organic regulations, um, the sanctions which are there, uh, so that they can be following the uh, organic rules and regulations. So in the national, uh, at the national level, um, when you look at the different uh, structures that can be there, and I mentioned some of them, you can have regional or county, like we have in Kenya, county platforms or committees which can be involved in robbing and coordinating PGS activities at the county level, because agriculture now is devolved. And uh, you know, for some counties, especially the ones which uh, are showing uh, they are pro-organic, we can, can actually work with them to have uh, this committee at the county level for PGS. We can have a national, we already have a national PGS committee in place, which is now doing approval, reviewing rules and regulations, and they also involved in approving uh, PGS group. Uh, they were erected last year and there are meetings uh, starting this year, uh, which will be quarterly meetings for doing uh, all these activities. We have a secretariat for PGS, uh, which is based at point for maintaining PGS register records for and coordinating PGS uh, activities uh, nationally. So um, in terms of market development, because it's quite important for PGS group, and uh, Sylvia will be talking about more about the uh, market, but there are, there are models that PGS can use for market development, for example, having a uh, linkage with traders or having their own organic farmers market or having organic uh, farm shop uh, for, for the group, uh, attending exhibitions and uh, you know field days and, and selling their products there, that's an opportunity for marketing. Uh, they can develop their own uh, organic brand, which they can market even in the supermarkets or, or shops. And, and all these activities should be embedded within the PGS uh, because they are required that the PGS will also be participating in the market. So operationalizing PGS at the group level uh, is a building capacity, is quite important of the farmers, uh, and also include the other stakeholders. Uh, developing the structures for the groups. Uh, of course, as I said, ensuring horizontality um, element is there, that all the members are participating, developing the group uh, procedures and documentation, uh, even doing conducting peer reviews, operating general assembly, uh, helping them to start uh, market initiatives, uh, marketing activities, and then facilitating these running activities like field days, workshops, uh, symposiums, and exhibitions. Um, operationalizing at the national level, of course, is developing the digital and national structures, uh, developing guidelines, procedures, and documentation and regulations for PGS. 
um, having given up with an, uh, an assessment or approval scheme for PGS, uh, you can have market development activities at the national level for PGS group, or you can have things like national PGS workshop which uh, we, uh, we are holding, uh, uh, and now uh, the PGS, national PGS committee is the one that is organizing this national PGS workshop. <laughs> Uh, it could be the symposiums also uh, being the, uh, held by PGS group, uh, which can integrate uh, institutions. So these are some of the pictures that uh, we have. For example, Kagari Organic Farmers Market. There is a PGS uh, in Kagari, which is running this uh, Kagari Organic Farmers Market. And they are also doing drying and value-adding hub and packaging. Uh, we also sell up on uh, wholesale to buyers who go and package uh, and sell to retailers. And we have this INOG of uh, PGS. Uh, last year it was awarded the PGS uh, of the month award. Uh, they have been quite successful in running their PGS at the Academy State. Um, quite a good PGS group. We also have Kikuyu Organic Farmers Market, which is run by Kikuyu Organic Farmers. Uh, they also have a PGS, quite uh, advanced PGS, so they run this farmer's market and they also have, they're working with uh, Sylvia, I think Sylvia will mention about them, uh, to buy their product for the market. So thank you very much, that is uh, what I have for now. I'd like to appreciate for you for listening. And uh, I think after uh, our moderator will, will tell us when we have a session for questions and answers. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dongo, for that wonderful presentation. I hope our partic participants are noting down if they have any questions. And then after Sylvia's presentations, we shall have the Q&A session. So kindly keep calm. Let us wait for the last session, the last period so that we can answer both questions from Sylvia, from Sylvia's presentation and from Domo's presentation. So right away, I want to invite Sylvia Kuria to take us off from there. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Give me a minute. Let me know if you can see my screen. I'm trying to, okay. So can you hear me and you can see my screen? Yes, Sylvia, you're audible enough and the screen is okay. Continue. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, sharing more about uh, the local organic markets and the potential. In fact, when we're discussing about what we're going to share uh, today for me, that was just, um, you know, what came up for me because when I just see the potential we have, you know, to be able to grow our local organic markets. And, you know, for me, my presentation is basically just to share my story, to see what we've been, just to share what we've been able to do and achieve. As you can see, what I'm holding in my hand is actually dried pineapples uh, from farmers in Uganda. So I just want to encourage you all and to also share, you know, about what, uh, we are doing to promote organic produce locally. Okay, so when you think about the, um, uh, just one minute, let me just change my, my screen here. I want to be able to, okay. Okay, so when you think about the organic markets and where they are in the value chain, uh, you know, this is just the typical agricultural value chain, what it looks like, all the way from production, harvesting and transport, uh, processing and storage, secondary processing, distribution, uh, where we can, you know, talk about handling and packaging, and then going all the way to the market. I just want to say that as we go through the presentation, I want us to have this value chain in our minds and just to see the great potential we have to actually uh, make an income in this organic uh, value chain that we have. 
most of us are actually in the uh, uh, the area of production. Um, very few of us are handling uh, uh, transportation. A few of us are doing a bit of the primary and secondary processing, which is you know to add value to the farm produce. Distribution, packaging, and handling, again, another gap. And then wholesale and retail markets, unfortunately, again, we are very few. So I would just like to encourage all of us, you know, as we go through this session, I want us to think critically and actually ask ourselves where there are gaps is where the business opportunities might be. And I'm not saying that we don't want the farmers to produce. We want farmers to produce as much as possible, but we don't want the farmers, you know, to struggle with the production and then, you know, also struggle with the markets, struggle with harvesting, processing, distribution, transportation, logistics. You know, we really have to see how we can actually be able to grow the um, um, organic markets. Because I believe we can't grow the organic markets unless we are growing through the whole value chain. So in this presentation, I'm going to share my experience um, as being able to have worked in the organic retail um, space uh, we have changed now and we as we go through the um, you know the presentation i'm going to share about my lessons learned and how we have um, evolved in the market space so of course you know that organic products are those that have grown grown under system of agriculture without the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides you know um, thinking about our environment and being socially responsible you know i think when you think about the different, um, what is it called? The principles of organic agriculture. You know, when you talk about care, health, environment, and fairness, you know, all these actually come under being socially responsible and making sure that, um, you know, we are taking care not only of the environment, but of the people that we are living with. So um, I wanted us just to look at the market scenario. What does it look like in terms of the dynamisms of the market chain? So in Kenya, this is how we experience, and I'm sure it's also similar in most of the um, African countries, whereby you have the producer, is mainly the market, uh, the, the farmer, sorry, the farmer. The farmer is the producer. And then when you go through, you normally find that uh, they're dealing with brokers all the way until you get to the supermarket or the retail shop or you know the open air market. So we normally have the first broker who's normally at the village, and the one at the village is one who normally knows what's happening on the ground. He knows what farmer is growing what, go to the farmers and buy from them. And then this broker normally goes to the second broker, is at the local market. So, you know, we have a lot of issues with infrastructure. So you'll find farmers are not even able to get local markets sometimes because um, the roads are not good. They have logistical challenges whereby you know you have your produce, but will you spend money to pay you know a transporter to take your produce to the local market? So you find this is a gap that brokers have come to fill in. So this village broker will then send uh, sell the produce to the broker, the local market. The one at the local market is like our aggregator. He aggregates things from the different parts of the village. He has things from this village, the other village, the other village, bring it together at the local market. And then now after that, um, you find that this broker from the local market will then take it now to the bigger markets, which is in Nairobi, uh, which is could be the Marigiti, say for example, the main markets in Nairobi, the bigger markets in Nairobi. And then from there, the things end up to the supermarket or to the retail shop or whatever. So you find, you know, um, because of this long chain, who gets the short end of the stick? Most times it's the producer who is the farmer. And then also when you look at this whole chain between the producer and the supermarket, you know, the farmer has very little access to information. They don't even know the cost of the product. You know, they don't know information. They don't have market intelligence because these three brokers are the ones who know everything happening in the market. They know the, 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 the consumers, they know the customers but the producer doesn't know what's happening. And then again, there's little or no power in the value chain relations, you know. Um, uh, the producer who is meant to have the most power has very little power, by the way. The brokers has the most power, but sometimes you might find the supermarket or retailer is the one who has the most power. 
So the, the person who's buying from all these brokers has the most power. They know exactly what they want. They know how it wants to arrive. They know how it needs to look like. So it's unfortunate that the producer then has the least power. But then now, um, you know, I'm just giving these scenarios also just for us to start thinking. Start thinking, how do you want the markets to be? How do you want to grow the market base in terms of organic? Okay. So for us, we are working on short food supply chains, you know, which is basically a term that describes, um, you know, whereby you're able to reduce the distance between the farm and your plate, you know. And these are things I, I always like to ask people as we go through this. I want you guys to ask yourself, how far is the distance between farm and plate? I hope we are really trying our very best to buy food from local markets. Uh, this is one of our customers who gave us a space so that we can actually be able to, you know, to sell things in her garden, you know. And, um, uh, you know, we have um, farmer's market, the farm shops, box schemes, uh, which is um, like home delivery baskets, which is what I've done for many years. I, I'm still doing now. We have uh, the community supported agriculture. We have cooperative movements whereby if you go to the local cooperative shop, you, uh, you're able to get produce. This has worked well, especially for coffee and tea. Like for me, if I want really good tea, I just go to the local cooperative uh, center where the tea is being collected at the factory and being processed. And I know I'll always get very good tea. So, you know, we are actually thinking, how can we reduce this distance between the producer or the farm to plate? So these are the different options that are available. So farm to fork. So uh, like for us, uh, you know, we have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, we started doing it in 2000 and, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember, 2013, 14 but then got registered in 2016. But from 2013, 14, I've really just been doing, you know, um, you know, the baskets. And basically the factors to consider when you want to market, you know, uh, your things you need to be able to know about the organic farms that have the produce, think about the pricing, uh, which is very important. So it means farmers also have to get a lot of market intelligence, think about the logistics, how is this produce going to be able to move from one from the farm, you know, to the home or to the market. And then also farmers have to really put into consideration a proper planting program. You know, one of the complaints we've always had as farmers, organic farmers, is that your produce is not consistent. And people are normally don't want to engage organic farmers because they're like, you're going to give me wonderful produce, but you won't have it tomorrow. But we have different challenges and I'm happy that my brother Sam actually brought it up that we also have farmers who are rainfed agriculture and there's nothing much you can do about it because the investment of being able to grow food all year round is also quite uh, critical and not everyone can actually be able to get it. But then when you have a planting program, even within the rainy seasons, you're still able to make money. Like about a month ago, we had training on our farm in Deya. Uh, I'm from Kiambu, Deya. And one of the things I encourage the farmers, I told them, okay, fine. We're in a semi-arid area. We don't have enough rain all year round, but since we have some rain, the long rains are coming. Let's prepare for what does well during the long rains. Um, let's have a planting program for the rainy season. And so there's basket will buy from you, whatever organic produce you're going to grow during the rainy season. So having a planting program is not just for the farmers who have got accessibility to water all year round, it's for all farmers. Work with the seasons, and I'm sure the seasons will still be able to make sure that you're able to um, access markets. And then, you know, of course, we're really struggling with unpredictable weather patterns. The weatherman, hopefully, is going to be right this year. He says that you're going to get some good rains. So the past two years have been really difficult for most of us because it's been extremely dry. And we've had to, uh, you know, manage uh, to grow our crops using irrigation, which is not very uh, uh, you know, sufficient and good as the rain. So let's hope the rains happen. But these are just some of the things to put into consideration as you consider having a farm to fork model. So why are customers buying organic products? Um, this was a survey done by Cohen some time back. Um, you know, uh, maybe some can confirm it, but I think it was some time back in 2016 or so, if I'm not wrong, when they did this survey. But basically, when we look at the different East African countries, 
you find uh, Kenyans, where are we? Our motivation to buy organic is with health. For us, we want something healthy. And this has also to do with the um, exposure, you know. And, uh, you know, we find that a lot of, um, uh, how do I put it? Like uh, the media engagement has told us that, you know, our milk is contaminated. Our skuma weekend spinach is contaminated. Our maize is contaminated. Our, you know, uh, you know, so many things are contaminated. Our meat is contaminated. <laughs> so you find because I think for Kenya, let me just focus on Kenya. For us, many people are actually buying for health reasons. And also the issue of uh, pesticides and not having chemicals. But you see, for Kenyans, we're not really buying organic because it's tasty, <laughs> unfortunately. The people who are enjoying good tasty food are Tanzanians. They're saying, as we're buying organic because it's very delicious, it's very tasty. But I also think um, as Kenyans really have to grow our organic sector because I think we've eaten, uh, we've not eaten organic produce for so many years until we don't even know that it tastes different and it actually tastes much better than the conventional produce. So we really have to work on uh, managing people's palates and teaching them organic is actually very tasty. But then, you know, I found this chart or this information very important to help me know how to market to make, help me know how to get to my consumers and tell them, you know what, the food you're eating organic is very healthy for you. It has no chemicals, it has no pesticides. That's what is working in Kenya. For our Ugandan friends, talk about the lack of pesticides, health and chemical, that is what is going to work. And then also Rwanda Burundi, you see, is also about the chemical and the health. And then our Tanzanians convinced people it's tasty and they will be happy to get it. So I just want to share uh, my learning. Uh, my journey of lessons learned in having an organic retail shop. So the first thing we did was to eliminate the middleman. Uh, you know, I don't know who is the middleman here. We can guess. Maybe it's the man at the fore uh, smiling <laughs> and the farmers at the back are not really very happy. <laughs> you know, we look at the picture. I thought that would be interesting. You know, the person who's at the forefront, who must be the middleman is the smiling one. The farmers are like, I'm not sure we are very happy that he's hiding ahead on top of the sack. But basically, um, the reason we actually started our shop was to get rid of the middleman in a way. I know it sounds very bad because we still need all the actors in the food systems and in the value chain. But then for us, um, you know, which is very important for us to actually make sure that we can be able to take our food from the farm and stretch to your plate. So we need the middlemen. I'm not trying to say that we don't need them. They're very important in the food systems. But for us, for this particular model, we're actually making sure that we're able to ensure that produce comes directly to um, the consumers from the farm. So we started with our home delivery baskets. And you can see we are here packing our nice baskets. This is one of the farmers in Deya, you know, who was supplying us, with, who was buying actually some produce from us. And you can see, you know, we just pack it in our vehicle and we're able to transport it all the way to Nairobi for sale. So I did the home delivery basket. I'm still doing it now, but then uh, the reason I put the dates is I was only doing home delivery baskets from 2015 to 2019. But then now we have uh, transitioned in business and learned uh, like different ways of uh, running this particular uh, sector. Then um, uh, this was our retail shop that we had from 2019, 2023. And uh, last year, December, we closed our retail shops and I'm going to share how we uh, transition but for now the new the next few slides i'm going to be talking more about a retail shop one thing i really enjoyed about having a retail shop is the easy shopping experience you know people could literally just walk in and buy what they wanted and walk out and then you're also able to have very good customer engagement you know people are able to come ask questions you know we really had some very good conversations in fact anytime i was working at the shop business was very slow because when customers come we had always, always very nice conversations, talking, exchanging ideas. And then also goods are available every single day of the week, which is wonderful because anytime you want to have any produce, you just need to call and we had the produce available. And then you also had greater inventory options, of course, because of the space, you know, we are able to have enough cereals. Like for us, we've always had about 35 to about even 50 uh, products on offer every single week. And you know, having a retail shop, of course, gives you that flexibility. 
And then also one um, major thing about, um, you know, having a shop is that you have to really work out your logistics. Without logistics, you cannot make it work. And I think that's the, actually the major impediment for many, you know, entrepreneurs wanting to open retail shops. They always ask, how will I get the produce to the shop? How will the farmers be able to transport it? And how will they pack it well? And you know, you have to think about a logistics partner. For us, we are very lucky, uh, you know, that we have uh, Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo is working very well. They are a wonderful logistics partner. We've been with them for the past five years. And then farmers also have to be able to think about aggregating their produce, you know, because farmers are struggling to make sure that they have, uh, you know, they are able to have a center where they bring their produce together, aggregate it, and then make sure it's in good quality, how do you pack it so that the produce is not um, damaged? And then, um, as I said, most farmers are not able to access markets because of logistical challenges. And here, I want to talk to development partners who are within our earshot today, invest in logistics. Our development partners kindly invest in logistics because that is the only way we are going to be able to break the barriers you know, between farmers being able to access markets and between retailers and business people and entrepreneurs like myself being able to access this produce. So I would encourage us, if you want to go into business for organics, think about logistics and development partners, please work with us in terms of making the logistics uh, work. So this is uh, the marketing for us. We've done a lot of online marketing. Uh, we use WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, talk. Uh, but from my experience, do you know what is working the most? WhatsApp. Instagram, I find people just scroll. Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, they hardly translate to sales, very rarely. We'll, um, uh, like, uh, like will an account, like will a post on Instagram put more money in my pocket, very, very, very rarely. WhatsApp works the most, you know, because Instagram, I find, you know, when you're busy or when you're free is when you just want to scroll. You scroll, you go up and down, up and down, up and down, just scrolling. Um, so you don't really make that decision to, to buy. But I find WhatsApp, because it seems to be the normal tool for communication, that people are actually, <coughs> excuse me, WhatsApp, I find people are normally more keen uh, to translate to sales, because they find that when you communicate with them on WhatsApp, it's real time. Someone writes a message, you respond, you know, you finish the transactions very quickly. So for us, WhatsApp has been the best. It's the one that's giving us the most sales. And then location is also very important. If you want to go into having um, um, a retail shop or a place where you want to sell. So, uh, you know, when you think about access, our very first shop did not have very good access because we're on the second lane from the highway. Someone had to go through, you know, some loopholes to get to the second lane where now our shop was. And then you, uh, but our last location was wonderful because it was on the main highway. And then when you think about even a slight difference in location can have significant effects on market share and profitability. So location is very, very, very important. We found our second location, which was on uh, like Gitanga Road in Lavington worked very well because we had very many homes. Uh, people could literally just walk to the place. We were on the first lane next to the road. So such things actually make distribution much easier. And then also where we were made uh, the distribution easier because we were close to so many neighborhoods, you know, around uh, one area. So it means our riders didn't have to go very far to deliver the baskets. And then also, uh, of course, we're located in a very densely populated area, close to very many homes. Pricing. You know, most times when I immediately open my mouth and I say, I'm an organic farmer, 90% of people stop listening to me because they're like, you're expensive. We can't afford you. Um, that's not for me. It's for maybe expatriates or other people who have got uh, financial um, muscle. I really like um, the concept that PGS is taking right now. And Sam shared it so well, you know, that we want to be able to get organic to the mass market. You will not be able to get organic to the mass market if it's going to be expensive, and if it's going to be a very, you know, costly uh, product, who is going to buy it? Who is going to be able to access it? You know, we can't do that. 
and it's not even fair, you know, to make it so expensive because are we trying to say that safe organic produce is only for a few? Are we trying to say that safe food is only for the rich? No, it's for everybody. And increased prices means organic price uh, is for the rich. And we are really trying to fight that. But if you're a farmer listening to me, kindly don't overprice your product because we are struggling with the farmers. Because the farmers have been told over the years, grow organic to get specialized market. Grow organic to get more money in your pocket. Well and good. But when you think about our situation in Kenya and Africa, we're able to grow food almost all year round. PGS certification is very affordable for the groups. Some has taken us through the whole system of PGS. That even if you're not certified, you can even actually be able to access markets based on trust and accountability, transparency, and being open for people to come and see how you grow your food. So we don't have an excuse to say that you paid a lot of money for certification. And you know, the thing about, about increased prices, it means increased fraud, you know, because if a farmer has a very small patch of skooma wiki, they've been selling at a good price for organic. When the skooma is finished, see the farmer will just get the conventional skooma and supply the normal organic market to get the money. So increased prices means increased fraud. That's why we really have to standardize our prices. And then fraud, you know, in turn, is the biggest long-term risk to maintaining customer demand because we cannot, we, we, you can't run a business on fraud. But increased prices, that one 100% will get into fraud. And then, of course, uh, the PGS um, and the Kilimohai mark are buffers against fraud and exorbitant prices for organic produce. So we really have to work with these systems. We have a wonderful PGS system that is functional and is working in East Africa. Let's make good use of it. We have the Kilimohai mark. Even whatever fees we have to pay to use the Kilimohai mark are extremely subsidized, extremely. So there's no excuse for us not to say we're not using the Kilimohai mark for organic, you know, to say that we can't be able to access it. It's very, very accessible. So of course, that's a beautiful picture of one of my best organic shops in Africa, which is SAT. Uh, uh, the Sustainable like Kacha Tanzania, they have a beautiful shop in Morogoro. Uh, you know, if I have my Tanzanian people here, uh, you know, um, you have a wonderful shop there in Morogoro. I visited it and learned lots of lessons. Okay, so the cost of opening and running a retail shop, this is just for us to know. You have to think about the issues of rent, licensing, uh, store fixtures, you know, um, inventory, equipment and technology, web hosting, um, you know, uh, you know, having supplies of the cleaners and things of the source, uh, business insurance, signages, interior decor and aesthetics, and also other costs. So retail is not an easy business. I did it for four years, but it has very good um, inroads into the market and works quite well. And something else I had to learn much later on, and I said I must share with anyone who wants to start a, a retail shop, there's something called sales to wages ratio. So the average payroll um, sales uh, ratio is between 10 to 20%. So basically, this is it. When you think about your sales to wages, you know, some of us, when we started our business, we did it emotionally because we love people and we love organic and we love all those things. But emotions will not help you make the right decisions. You have to know how to pay people according to your sales. So basically, the payroll to sales, so basically, you pay people a salary uh, between 10 to 20% of your sales, nothing higher than that. And when I did my research, I found the big organized uh, retailers like Kafu, uh, Naivas, uh, we don't no longer have task keys, but Quickmart and all the others take this ratio very seriously. And very few of them ever get 20%. 20% is extremely high. That has to be, uh, you know, a proper multinational uh, retail something. Maybe Kafu would get 20%. But the rest of us, if you want to open a retail shop kindly, keep your payroll to sales ratio at 10% and nothing more than that. So if you're making 100,000 shillings maybe um, a week, 
then your payroll or salaries is about 10,000 shillings. That's how you'll manage um, all these costs. Because if you make your payroll too high, you won't manage rent, licensing, you'll just be at total loss. So keep it at that. I know you don't have to do this, but this is for anyone who'd like to open a retail shop. For me, it was sharing my experiences, sharing my learnings. This was a huge lesson I had to learn much later on. Because for me, I had gone above even 50%, which was not very clever, and it cost me. So lessons learned. Um, they say that retail has been branded as one of the worst businesses. <laughs> and I was in it, so I can actually say that it could be true. It's not easy because of the monthly fixed costs. Um, and then, of course, it has high working capital. And farm customers are very fickle. One day they like you, tomorrow they don't. You make the customer upset today, they block you for life. I mean, it happened to us very many times. Someone is like, you're extremely unprofessional. You didn't give me the good products, I'm out. You know, very fickle customers. They're in and out, in and out. They're very difficult to please. Mm, they, are, they get upset with you very quickly and they leave you high and dry. And then low barriers to entry. I mean, it's not very easy to get in because of the many things that you have to think about, the um, licensing, city council. Like for me, one of the reasons I closed my shop was of city council. I had it. I was like, in Nairobi, running a retail shop, you're treated like a criminal. And I was like, I don't have to be treated like a criminal. I can be able to make it much better. Then of course, there's a steep learning curve. Um, I'm writing a book with my experiences. The learning curve is, is very, very steep. You have many things you're going to learn and it's not easy, but it's doable. So where am I right now? I'm now doing an aggregation organic hub. Um, we had a bit of loss uh, at the end of last year and we had to recalibrate. And we said, this organic shop is not working for us anymore. Now we're going to do something that is going to work much better. And some mentioned Kikuyu Organic Farmers Market, uh, who have a center in Kikuyu. So we talked to them and we've rented out a small space at their center and we're developing an aggregation hub, which has uh, been in existence for two and a half months. Very excited. And it's working out so much better because I've been able to cut out the high licenses. Let me just take you guys back here. I'm saving so much. I don't have to pay a big rent. I'm not paying big licenses. I don't have to think about the store, inventory, equipment and technology is very minimal. Web hosting is small, you know, the cleaning and all that. Business insurance, I don't have to do it. Signage is very little, interior decor, none. So um, the aggregation hub is working for us very well. And how we are uh, developing the aggregation hub, and I think, um, if you're a farmer here, please get back uh, to me, get in touch with me, because I want us to see how we can work together with farmers. I've already decided to out with different farmers. So far, I have my farmers, and um, we're actually helping the farmers access markets. Right now, I should have put it in the presentation, I didn't. Uh, but right now, we're actually buying one ton of organic produce from farmers every single week. I'm very excited about that. And then we are also trying to build the capacity of farmers. I can't do it on my own. We've partnered with Cohen, we're working with Pelham, um, and just seeing how can we be able to um, train the farmers, build their capacity, you know. Uh, of course, with also the other organizations like Bivat, of course, I can't forget Bivat, uh, Rodi, all these organizations are doing such a wonderful job, you know, uh, with farmers, making sure that farmers can um, have capacity building. C Shape, of course, we work very closely with C Shape, and C Shape. Uh, have a center in Deya, and they're doing a wonderful job in building capacity of farmers, training them. They have a wonderful training center. But if you're looking for a place to do training for farmers, please consider going to C Shape in Deya. They're doing a wonderful job. Um, of course, we have IPMA, uh, Dr. Mihindo's place, um, you know, in Ruiro, whereby they're also building capacity. Of course, and I can't forget my friend, uh, Sam Derito at GBAC, you know, being able to build the capacity of farmers. So for us, having this aggregation center is working with all, you know, of these different people, making sure that we're able to build their capacity, 
train the farmers, and then also give them inputs. You know, import provision is key. In terms of, uh, you know, we had this scandal of uh, the fake fertilizers, you know, but for us, we are dealing with real people. You know, we have, uh, you know, different input providers who are working with our farmers in terms of being able to um, give them access to fertilizer, give them access to pesticides. But another thing I want to say is that as you build the capacity of farmers, you bring down the need for them to get inputs. Like I was talking to one, uh, my farm manager uh, two days ago, and he told me a peachy is magic. If you don't know a peachy, you must have missed the class with uh, Dr. Mihindo, and you can uh, maybe look at the recordings, but a peachy is a pest control. And he said it works very well. He's like, it's getting rid of all the trips, all the sucking insects. Our farm is beautiful because we are using a peachy. And then also in terms of capacity building, uh, you know, we had our sessions on soil with Ferdinand and also with um, Sam Derito of GBAC. And they're teaching farmers, how do you fix your own fertilizer? You don't have to buy. How do you make your own compost? You know, like for me, I don't buy any compost. I don't buy fertilizers. I don't buy pesticides. But then we have to support the farmers. At our aggregation hub, we're going to be training farmers on how to be able to uh, reduce the cost of inputs or where they can actually be able to get the inputs. And then being able to have a consistent market. Now for us, we are working overnight to make sure we always have a market so that I'm not going to give farmers long stories. When the farmers have grown the produce, I will not give them long stories at it is no market. So for us, we're really working with the farmers. And then of course with consumers, aggregation, it provides consumers with greater access to locally produced food which in turn can encourage more, more people to buy locally. For me, I'm so passionate about local markets. Everyone tells me, Sylvia, are you exporting? I'm like, mm -mm, I'm not exporting any produce right now. I really want to focus on uh, Kenya, East Africa and the African continent. In fact, for us, our hub, we are growing it to be Africa-wide. Um, AFSA, which is the Alliance of Food Sovereignty in Africa, came up with my best book right now called My Food is Africa. And in that book, it talks about the different, beautiful, wonderful African cu cuisines that are found on the whole continent. And you know, for us, we just want to make sure that our hub is going to have food from Ivory, you know, you're going to be getting shea butter from Ivory Coast, uh, you know, things that we can't, of course, get regionally. Uh, we're going to get olive oil from Morocco, you know, we're going to have all these produce on the African continent coming through Sylvia's Basket um, Aggregation Hub. And for me, the lessons learned in retail are wonderful. And I would like to encourage as many people within my hearing, please join retail, don't stop retail. I didn't say retail is bad. I've just shared my learnings. But for us, we want to be able to get more farmers, want to be able to bulk our organic produce, want to be able to make sure that we are working with markets in the region and on the continent. So that's where I'm at right now. And we just really just want to make sure that our hub is able to meet the needs of the farmers and also meet the needs of the consumers. So right now, uh, this is my last slide, uh, talking about uh, bulk buyers, you know, our best bulk buyer and the one that we're working with right now is Greenspoon. Uh, it's an online shop and Greenspoon has been a wonderful partner. You know, I cannot describe how it's been so good to work with them. They are our biggest bulk buyers for better incomes, of course, they're the ones who are taking up almost um, all my produce from our farmers. And bulk buyers, you know, they actually are consistent and able to ensure farmers can go produce with an assured market. You know, the farmers really just want to know that they are able to have a market every single week. And farmers are so encouraged. Like I remember we sold out on all mangoes. Like every week we were buying so many mangoes from the farmers until the mangoes were like, okay, now Sylvia, we don't have any more mangoes. Now I actually have um, one of my friends uh, from Manor House. They're working with farmers in Pokot and they're looking for mangoes in Pokot. There'll be some mangoes coming through. And then also I once wanted to ask if there's anyone here from Western Kenya, Rongo Migori, I'm told you have mangoes, please get in touch with me as soon as possible. But then for us, we really want to be able to get to bulk markets. Right now we're only doing one turn a week, we are in negotiations with other bulk markets. I want us, we are hoping and praying and wanting to work with all of you for us to get to two to three times a week, I think won't be too bad, you know, for a start. 
And just to encourage farmers to know that markets are there. It's possible for you to get bulk buyers. And, um, you know, there's so much potential in organic local markets. So I know we have some of us who are, <coughs> excuse me, who are doing export, which is wonderful. We can't all be everywhere. But for us who are passionate about local organic markets, get in touch with Sylvia's Basket. You know, um, let's have this conversation. Let's be able to, to grow together, you know. Um, yeah, so call to action. Organic retail is only reaching 0.001. I forgot to put the percentage <laughs> percent of the population in Kenya. So, you know, when you're thinking about what business can I do that will make you money, this is it. You can see the need. We are reaching 0.001% of the population in Kenya. And Kenya only has three outlets retailing in organic produce, ours being one of them. Um, Smallholder organic farmers are only selling 40% of their organic produce in specialized markets. So most of our farmers are actually selling their produce to conventional markets, which is very unfortunate. After all the hard work, capacity building, and that we've done, they still sell their things to uh, the conventional market. Let's work hard together to make sure that farmers are actually selling 100 of their produce to specialized markets. For my farmers, by God's grace, 90% of my farmers are selling all their produce to Sylvia's Basket. I'm almost able to accommodate everything from my farmers, the farmers who are working with us. Then the Kilimohai Mark in East Africa is underutilized. I mentioned it earlier. Guys, the only way we can actually be able to assure people that we have good produce is if we use the Kilimohai Mark. Let people see it. Let people know the Kilimohai Mark is working. And it's the mark for PGS Organic in East Africa. Aggregation centers need to be set up to bulk organic produce. We have ours in Kikuyu. I'm hoping to have another one in Western Kenya. And even at the coast area, Machakos, we can actually be able to get produce from those areas. At the different gateways in Kenya, let's partner and work together. You know, now we only have a little small one, but we want to be able to have a gateway through Western Kenya, another gateway through Eastern, another gateway through North, and another gateway through West, um, East. Yeah, east, west, north, and south. Let's get aggregation centers in all the gateways in Kenya. And then the market for organic produce is unquenchable. You don't, we cannot meet it, all of us, even if we tried, you know. And remember, we're not only thinking about Kenya, we're thinking about East Africa, and we're thinking about our beautiful African continent. So those are my handles. Please get in touch, get in touch. Let's talk, um, let's grow organic uh, markets on the African continent. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, thank you, Sylvia. That was a wonderful presentation. I mentioned in the beginning that this could be a, a place for networking and collaboration. And actually, Sylvia has made a call to action. So at this moment, Sylvia be on standby. Sam, Samuel Landong will be on standby. It's now the question and answer session. And I'm going to start with uh, Oyena, who has raised his hand. His or her. Oyena, kindly, if you can uh, switch on your mic. I don't know if uh, that person is around. There was an, uh, a hand But if, if that person is not around, I'm going to appreciate first of all allow me to appreciate uh, we've had um uh, from south africa following mm. us on um on uh, facebook we've had emmanuel from zimbabwe we've had charles from malindi paul from tarakanidi and other people have been really consistent throughout the training station so if uh, uh, we do not have other people, uh, the person on, who had raised the hand. 
I'm going to ask a question that has been asked by Ruth. Ruth is asking, do you ensure that um, each, and she's also asking if you're also certifying each crop. So maybe Samuel, can you answer that question? Uh, I think um, uh, Grace has been, uh, I think our network is not very good. Uh, but uh, I see prepares to join. Maybe I can answer Ruth's uh, question. She was asking whether uh, during when you are doing a CGS assessment, whether we assess uh, every individual farmer, uh, whether they meet the organic standards. Uh, yes, um, when you are doing peer review, which is done by the members of the CGS group. The, every farmer is visited and is required that uh, there should be no farmer who, uh, who will not be visited. So the compliance by the internal rules is by all the farmers. So the visiting uh, route is done by all, to all the members of the group. And you also ask uh, whether you have written standards for groups, for vegetables, fruits, and legumes. Uh, the standards that we are using for now is the uh, African organic product standard. So what we require is that uh, a group can uh, domesticate uh, those standards by developing their own internal regulations or rules uh, based on that is African organic product standard. So that, that's what they are supposed to do. Uh, why do we domesticate these standards? We should put them in a language that they understand. Uh, actually, it's preferred if they can do it in their local language. Uh, local spoken or, or written language, uh, a language that they can be able to understand and read for all the members. So, uh, so that is the standard that we try to domesticate for the different crops. Because if you look at the production standard, they are the same, uh, irrespective whether you are talking about legumes or vegetables or fruits. Uh, it runs across all the all the crops. Um, back to you, uh, Grace. Sorry for you have missed you for some time. I was answering the questions from Ruth uh, about the um, organic standards and whether they are met by each individual farmer and about the uh, written standards of fruits and vegetables. Up to you, um, Grace. Grace, you can continue. Thank you so much, Sam. And sorry for that hitch. Yes. Uh, we have another question uh, from, uh, it says personal. Wonderful experience sharing, Sylvia. Thank you. How consistent, as far as compliance is concerned, are the certified farmers you are working with? This is from Margaret Kabuye, our master trainer from Uganda. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret, for that question. I think what I would say for me, um, you know, because I'm at the end, part of the value chain, which is at the markets, I rely on partners to actually follow through, you know, with the part of the consistency uh, with certification. Because for me, of course, because now we are working out there with uh, the market, we have to make sure that all the products are certified. But I don't have the capacity, you know, to be out there to follow through with all the farmers. But, you know, uh, corn, as I was mentioning, the different partners we work with, Kwan, Pelam, C Shape, and all these other organizations actually have those systems in place. And I only buy my produce from their farmers because they have the systems in place, they have the capacity, they are working on the ground to make sure that the farmers are able to be consistent in their certification. Because now, when I buy produce, say, let me give an example, we normally buy produce from different PGS groups. You know, but you see the PGS groups already have a particular system that's already in place. They have their leaders, uh, you know, they have their checks and balances. So that works very well for me then. When I'm buying from the PGS groups, I know that, you know, the groundwork has been done. I know the field officers from Kwan and the rest are actually doing their work to make sure that the PGS groups are compliant and working through. So I'm not able to follow through on my own, but I work with partners. And then I only focus on the market part to make sure that this wonderful organic produce gets a market. Thank you, Sylvia. <clears throat> and uh, there is also another question from Keith Baraza. 
Hello, Sylvia. Do you also buy sweet potatoes from farmers? I'm in Mumia's Kamega County. If yes, <laughs> let me know, please. Having orange and yellow fleshed varieties. Yeah. So we buy sweet potatoes. We love sweet potatoes. In fact, the ones in Western Kenya are the ones which are my favorite. And we buy from uh, farmers as, you know, for us in Western Kenya, we are working with different farmers. We work with farmers through ADS, which is um, Anglican Development Society. They also do a lot of organic farming. So what I would recommend for him, because it might be difficult for me to, to buy directly from him because of his question, um, you know, but then now what I would uh, recommend for him is to work with the local partners. You know, he said he's from which part, Grace? I'm sorry. Did he say Kakamega or Mumias? He said Mumias. Yes, from Kakamega. Yes. Is he, if he's from Kak Kakamega? Mumias, Kakamega County. Okay. Okay. Mumias is a bit further off. But what I would recommend is um, I would like him to get in touch with Biovision Africa Trust or ADS, which is the Anglican Development Society. Um, and Pelham also, they have a field officer there. Those different organizations who are promoting organic, it would be great if he was attached to them and then they can visit his farm and ensure that, again, he's following the proper practices. If he needs to be linked up to a local PGS group, join the PGS group and then you can be able to access our market. You know, that's how we work. Uh, but yes, we buy sweet potatoes. Thank you very much for that question. And I hope this can also answer the question of many other people who could be listening and are interested in accessing markets for the organic produce, yeah. So I think it is important uh, that we, maybe we can get his contacts and then connect him to the organizations within that area. Exactly. So Barasa, you can leave your contacts. We will follow up with that. Yeah. There is also a, a question from uh, Sarah Olembo. Sylvia, thank you so much for the effort that you you can reach out to other countries in Africa and off, offer the market through Sylvia's basket. A country like Cameroon is inexhaustible when it comes to diverse local organic products. Do we have equivalents in GPS so that when you buy products from these countries, their products comply with the Kilimo High Max standard? Okay, for me, I'm going to let Sam answer that part of the certification for him to confirm whether, you know, whatever is recognized as organic in Cameroon, you know, would actually fit our standards in East Africa. But yes, you know, our vision is for that. And, you know, like I've traveled to a few countries in Africa, even just here in Tanzania, you know, it's normally so sad just to see these farmers have got very nice cashew nuts. You know, we are struggling to, pro to produce cashew nuts. Tanzania, they are swimming in cashew nuts. We are not able to get those cashew nuts to Kenya because of logistical problems, issues at the border and things of the sort, you know. And that's why we need to have partners like Kwan, you know, who are really advanced in marketing and certification to break these bottlenecks to make sure now these markets are free. But then let, me, uh, uh, let me ask Sam, please answer the question about the Cameroonian organic certification versus our East Africa one. Yeah, so I didn't just mean, I'm sorry to, uh, to, 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 to crush in, but it's not just, I'm not limiting my question to only Cameroon. As you have said, Tanzania with the cashew nuts, many other countries, you go to Togo, there is a lot of shea butter, and uh, you know many of the products that we really require. So what I'm wondering is that Sylvia, can we, is, is there support you need so that Sylvia's basket can even become the bee of of Africa? Because yeah. you are doing quite a lot. And why should we be taking our products to Europe, exhibiting yeah. in Biofac when we have you around? How can we do to scale you up so that you get to that level and we call you Sylvia Biofac Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, Sarah. That's, you know, one of the things I really like about Dr. Sarah Olembo is because she encourages me all the time. And, you know, the support that I can say we really need right now is just to make sure that we are able to deal with the logistical barriers. I think that is the biggest headache for me, you know, because about three weeks ago, I was with a lady from Togo, actually. And, you know, I'm not able to get her, uh, you know, like um, 
shea butter. I don't even know where to start. But for her to take her shea butter to France is overnight. You know, all the parts are open. But for me to get it here in Kenya is a headache. So we really have to uh, break down the, the logistical barriers between the countries. And I cannot do that on my own. I need people from FAO, I need people from um, IFC and all those organizations from Africa Union. You know, we have our um, Africa Union organic, what is it called? Anyway, but I need people in AU to help me. How can we yes, break this? Sylvia, there is an opportunity for you now that anybody can come into Kenya. Is that an opportunity that you can exploit? Because those traders are there. We have our contracts, particularly in all countries that are under Pelham or agroecology. They can bring those, those products. It's just a transportation, you know, uh, hitches. But otherwise, now that anybody can come, I think yeah. that's a plus for you. Yeah, so you can exploit that niche that uh, at least the president has given to us to see how we yeah. can utilize it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And we have to start somewhere. You know, we don't have to start big. They don't have to start with one ton of shea butter. But if you can start with 20, 30 kilos and then move it progressively. Very nice. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah, for that contribution. Thank you. And encouragement. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. I think... Um, I think they told Ndungu to come in. Ndungu hasn't yes. responded. Ndungu needs to answer also. Uh, hi, yes. Dr. Sarah. Thank you for your question and your participation. Um, actually, all over Africa, if a farmer is, uh, you know, complying to a uh, standard, which is part of high farm family of standards, uh, then that forms like an equivalent of the cream high or the South African organic product standard. And we can accept uh, the products as, as organic. So what is important is, uh, is the farmer complying to a standard, an organic standard, which is part of high farm uh, family of standards. If yes, uh, yes, we accept those products as organic uh, products. That, that's what I could say about uh, the different certification programs and the standards that we have in Africa. Thank you, Ndongo, for your response. Thank you, thank you. We'll exploit that, uh, that avenue, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sara. Uh, any other person in the room with a question? Kindly, you can raise your hand. I don't see any question uh, on our chat. Ratemo, can you see any question from your end? No. All right, maybe we can give a few minutes if there is anyone here who wish to ask any question. All right. If we do not have any Grace, other why don't you take this as a why don't you take this as a as a, as a, for us to take away and uh, and exploit you know this uh, free movement of peoples in Africa and the fact that Pelham yes. and agroecology we are working together through biovision the whole idea of these conferences that we hold is to showcase the products that we have in our hands and in the various countries Uganda did a great job. When we went there as Aola, we, we wanted to stay in Uganda, I tell you. And it's just next door. Why? There are no limitations, really, for us to, to have an input and uh, all of us to be able to participate in, uh, in the Syria basket, being that we have got this PGS certification system and the iPhone standards that uh, in, you know, Mr. Ndunga has just referred to. We have countries all over Africa. What can we do? Can we deliberate on this question and to see how we can be able to put our resources together and lift up Sylvia's baskets into an continental basket. Thank you, Sarah. I think this is an action point uh, for us and uh, Pelham. From here, yes. I think we need to have a follow-up meeting concerning this. Rate more mm. kindly note. I Please. It is important that we follow up. It should not just be a mouth talk. We need to take action now. No. Mm -hmm. Actionable. Yes. Maybe yeah. I can comment. Yes. Uh, I think uh, we in Uganda, this committee, I think Mr. Noah is the interim chair. 
the Joint Management Committee in terms of norms in East Africa. Maybe you can share a bit about it. I don't know. Because I think that's one of their roles to break barriers of trade. Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, also talk about the continental free trade area. Hmm? Yeah, we have that as well. So in your answer, please include the AFCTA. Yeah, so, so thank you, um, Dr. Sarah and uh, Ratemo. Uh, when we had the Africa Organic Conference in, uh, in Rwanda, in Kigali, uh, we actually had a side meeting uh, discussing uh, how we can harmonize our participatory guarantee system. Um, and part of the discussion, we agreed that uh, we are going to have a follow up uh, because from uh, 2000 and uh, I think 2010, we have been having a joint management committee for East African Organic Product Startups, uh, which has been uh, having participation from the all East African countries. And this joint management committee uh, have been used for benchmarking on the PGSs and how we are developing PGS groups in our different countries the procedures we are using, uh, the system that we have been using so that we can have a harmonization. You know, harmonization is very important uh, because it encourages free flow of products and the uh, acceptability and the cognition of uh, different certification systems across countries. And uh, if we can have this sort of broadened so that we can cover all the countries in, the, in Africa, I think that this will be very important and encouraging uh, a free flow of products across the different African countries. As uh, Sarah, you are mentioning, if you have all the countries opening their borders, because as you know, the borders that were put uh, in Africa uh, actually were even dividing communities. You know, for example, Kenya, Tanzania, you have Maasai, is a community, one community, but uh, now with uh, this um, unforeseen line, which is a border with Tanzania, we have Masai is in Kenya, Masai is in Tanzania, they are all relatives and they can't see visit each other freely because they are in different countries. I mean, as uh, Kenya has done, I think we need to have all the countries opening their borders uh, so that we can have one community of Africa and Africans. And then we can encourage now the free flow of products uh, from one country to another without, uh, you know, all these uh, mandatory barriers you know, coming in, um, you know, between us. In our country, and this can actually encourage the uh, growth of organic sector, uh, you know, and, and also enjoying organic products from different parts of Africa, uh, easily. Um, yeah, so uh, as you say, it's very important that we, we cultivate and we utilize the opportunities which are coming up with, the, you know, opening our borders and having free flow of products across the different uh, African countries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel, for your feedback. I think uh, that this conversation will not stop there. It will continue. Let me allow Kid to say something. His hand is up. Kindly, Baraza, switch on your mic. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity you are giving me. Uh, I'm, what I'm asking is for how do I be linked with the PGS group and Biovision Trust within the Kamega County? All right, thank you. Samuel, will you respond to that? That is it. Um, I will encourage uh, Barasa to uh, leave his contact with us. Um, there are um, biovision staff who are working in West, Western Kenya, and I'd like to uh, link uh, him with them. And some of them, they are part of the capacity building program that we are currently running for TOTs, for trainers mm -hmm. of trainers and the PGS assessors. And I'd like to link uh, them with him so that uh, they can work with him on the developing a PGS group. Our uh, PGS group is the other group that we'd like to develop as a PGS. So, can you just leave your contact and then I'll, I'll follow up and link you with uh, 
to the staff. Yes, his contact is already on uh, chat. Kindly pick it from there. And I thank you, Barasa, for that concern. We will uh, follow up with you. Any other person before I can um, uh, give our presenters to give their final word, and then I give it to to Ratemo. From here, I don't see any person with any word. So maybe I'll take it back to Dongo. You give us your parting shot, and then Sylvia, and then I'll hand it back to Ratemo. Um, thank you, Grace Nitoi, uh, and thank you for being a very good rapporteur. We appreciate that. And uh, thank you for all the participants and the listeners, uh, Facebook followers who are following this discussion. Uh, PGS uh, is, is being developed as a, you know, the next frontier and uh, a very good tool that uh, is affordable, especially for smallholder farmers, that can really help to expand uh, organic production and the market access for farmers, especially in rural areas. And I would encourage every one of us to support uh, PGS development and work with groups so that uh, we can recognize farmers who are already doing organic, but they are not formally recognized by, you know, forming the CGS group. And because, you know, in Africa, we have a big potential for organic production. And sometimes it's a pity that uh, what is the, we report as uh, organic is quite small, but we report that small because we haven't formalized our system. So if we can formalize uh, this uh, production system through PGS, then of course now we will be showing the true uh, picture of Africa that you know we are uh, producing a lot of organic products, and uh, through PGS also we will encourage more farmers to be participating in, in, in the market and earning the livelihoods uh, through organic farming. And in this way, then we can actually bring a change in the world. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish everybody uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Sylvia? Yeah, and maybe just to echo, you know, what Sam is saying about us being able to really, you know, um, take advantage of PGS, as I mentioned earlier, and also um, the Kilimohai mark, because PGS, in my opinion, is the gateway to markets, you know, like now, uh, you know, we have our friend Keith Baraza, you know, who's asking, I have sweet potatoes, how can I be able to access a market, you know, PGS and the Kilimohai mark is the powerful tool that will help him be able to access the markets. So I think for me, it's just to encourage us to um, produce wonderful organic produce, take advantage of the local settings of uh, the Kilimohai market and PGS. Buy local, make sure you buy food uh, from the farmer closest to you as possible, uh, you know, and um, I'm sure with time, if all of us do our own small things, we'll actually be able to grow our local market. So thank you, Grace. Uh, thank you to Pelham also, this, uh, the Pelham team, uh, for giving us this chance just to share our story, our vision that we can be able to grow together. Thank you. But Sylvia, when I go to Chandarana, I hardly see that mark of Kilimohai to where is it? The other day we were just chatting with the Mr. Organic and we realized that uh, the only label you get maybe from the fruits that are imported is uh, whether it is pesticide treated or whether it is a GMO. But to yeah. see organic, labeled organic with the Kilimohai mark, I have yet to see that mark on any product that I buy from green grocers at, Chand at Adam's Arcade there. I mean, at uh, Yaya or the Chandaranas. I don't see that label. So where is it hidden? Because I always look for it. I know what you mean. And basically, just to mm. let you know real quick, the, um, you know, uh, the corner shop, I think, are the ones who supply Chandarana. Some you can confirm that if I'm not right or wrong. But, um, you know, we've been having discussions with them and want to see how they can actually be able to incorporate um, the organic produce and actually have it there. But if you go to Kafu, you will find organic products with the Kilimohai mark, at least the Kafu supermarkets, I know they have organic produce. And sometimes whenever we don't have something, I know I always buy from the organic section, section in Kafu. And we are still in discussions, you know, because if Chandrana is able to buy from us, then, you know, we're able to increase markets for the bulk buying at the 
aggregation centers and actually pick as much as possible. So uh, coming soon, thanks for that concern, but we are working on it, yeah. So Carrefour, all of the Carrefours have that? Yes, Carrefour have got organic section with the Kilimohai. It's labeled. Yeah. With the Kilimohai. It's labeled. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Yes, thank you, Sylvia, for that. Now I understand why Sylvia was saying we are only meeting 0.001% of the the market here in Kenya, a lot needs to be done. And I'm excited that uh, I am part of this big family. I want to appreciate all the masters. Allow me to recognize Ferdinand Wolf, Esther Kirudi, Dr. Mihi, work you've done during this week, and not just this week, in the program, the care program. Thank you for your relentless efforts to support our farmers, to support the multipliers. I know you're getting a lot of calls and you're doing your best. I want to also appreciate all the participants from Monday for turning up in good numbers. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for the networks. I have made friends here. I have expanded my network through this, um, this week. Thank you very much. I also want to say that uh, it doesn't stop here. It does not stop here. Let us continue with the good work. Let us continue with the good work. I also want to appreciate Pelam Kenya for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Madam Rosina and the entire management of uh, Pelam Kenya. And of course, the wonderful lady Ratemo. You've been up and down ensuring that uh, everything is running smoothly. Thank you for the coordination as well. To this point, uh, allow me to say bye bye to everyone and welcome Ratemo to wind up the session by maybe recognizing those who are here. Ratemo, you can take over now. Uh, thank you. I think we are winding up. It was a week of uh, agroecology webinars. I hope you have been inspired. For me, I have. Each day had its own session. And like Soy has said, the conversation does not stop. All our trainers are on social media. We have been tagging. So you can also continue conversing with them. So I want to give some general updates in terms of the presentations. All of them will be available on our website. I'm going to share the link, everyone who registered. And then for the recordings, all of them will be available on YouTube. At the same time, some will be on Facebook. And now I want to request everyone to turn on their camera so that we just take a photo as we conclude. I hope that's okay. If you can switch on so that we actually know who was here. We see a name, but we don't know the face. If you can switch on your camera, please do. I see you, Dr. Mihindo, Karibu Sana, Andrew, Asante. Teresa. Amen. Thank you. Miss Oy, I don't see you. Dr. No, Lembo, no, who are you with? <laughs> I'm not able to switch on my camera, Ratemo. Let me, uh, let me try to unlock that. What about now? It's working. Perfect. No, 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 no. Who yes, are you with? Yes, I'm with James Adaba. <laughs> he comes from Passion of Hope. Passion of Hope. A pleasure. Mm. So I've taken a photo for our report purpose. So thank you so much, everyone who joined. And next month, we are going to plan for another uh, webinar series with our master trainer. I see Florence from all the way from Uganda. Do you want to say hi? Florence? You can... This is Margaret Kawie. Oh, Margaret. Ah, yes, yeah. nice to see you, Ratemo. Thank you. Nice to see you, Ratemo. Nice to see you, Hello, it has been very nice. Thank you so much for the all arrangements. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Florence. All the way from Uganda. Thank you so much. So if the Uganda also have a webinar, we are going to share so that you also part of what is happening in Uganda. So that's it from Pelam Kenya. We appreciate everyone who took time 
every day to have this webinar for like two hours. Thank you so much. So that's it. I want everyone to say bye like this. <laughs> bye bye Thank and have you. a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hi, so I hope to hear from you. Hi. Bye -bye. Hi, no more. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you remain behind. Yeah. <laughs> you are student, yes. Thank you. It's not very nice about you.